times, because in true uh, Arab or Mediterranean fashion, I'm definitely going over time. So, morning you from now. Um, yeah, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be my check. Um, so, uh, hello everybody. I hope uh, everyone's doing well, not too hungover from yesterday. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sort of betraying my abstract a little bit. Um, I know many don't actually look through the abstracts so and necessarily take you know the full time to, to read them, so that's a good, a good thing. Um, so in a sense, there is a bit of betrayal, but I think um, only as part of what I'm going to be talking about today, which is betrayal in order to be more faithful somehow. Um, so the, the roadblock theme, again, obviously, you know, a potentially kind of inexhaustible political theme, uh, conjures all sorts of things, you know, the police, the army, the law, the barricade, uh, colonialism, um, trauma, violence, the things we've been uh, listening to today. Um, so the presentation, I think that I'd like to expand on this notion of the roadblock, to sort of form a constellation of, of, um, of, of words or meanings or words, um, coming from the word block, limit, impasse, uh, paradox, um, and back to aporia, aporia, which all points to some sort of um, you know struggle, to opposition, but something something beyond, something that is constituted by this paradox from it, from within it, as it were. So something that requires a specific terrain in order to uh, exceed it. So a roadblock, in a sense, is simultaneously a block and a, and a way through. Right? Uh, silly ad in the London uh, Underground. A lock is a gate. So, so I'm going to proceed um, in, in note fashion, in a sense. So they do all come together. Uh, there is a thread. Um, but I like the idea of a, a sort of thought notebook or associations. Uh, so there'll be notes on, on love on exhaustion, on the crisis of witnessing, testimony, fiction, um, as sort of roadblocks that carry something within and that allow us to, uh, to think things through together today. So I'm going to be asking, I'm going to be raising, hopefully, some questions rather than uh, responses or answers. Uh, I realized also along the way that um, most of you know the people I use or vulture are kind of white, uh, you know, Continental philosopher, white men, as it were. So we have put them to good use, I hope. <laughs> and um, along the way, we're going to stop um, with two artists, um, twice work. Uh, one is Yazan Chalili, who's with us here today. We're going to show um, a bit of his work on love and other landscapes, and uh, and the Atlas Group in the context of Lebanon um, and the Lebanese War. So I won't I won't start like um, Gianfranco with sex. Um, a little bit more conservative. We're going to start with Hannah Arendt instead. Um, so some writings on Hannah Arendt uh, present her thinking about politics and essentially carrying a double negative or to be colloquially dialectical as in um, a confrontation between uh, or an inevitable relation between nihilism and wrongdoing on the one hand and the labor of thought on the other. So kind of confrontation with empty present time as she calls it and need to undo accepted doctrines. The dark times that we inhabit are not the names and lists of 20th century tragedy. They are not, I quote, genocides, purges, and the hunger of a specific era. Instead, darkness refers to the way these horrors appear in public discourse and yet remain hidden. Official government speeches, news flashes, states of emergency, diplomacy, protocol, humanitarian discourse, embedded journalists, taken further identity politics, are precisely masking from view the very life at stake. They perform the very same act, or at least engage in an orderly polemic within the confines and grammar of the public discourse that has in the first instance produced and framed or masked these issues. So how do we take this masking while showing, this paradoxical masking while showing, to make it burst, to produce other effects, affects, politics, positions? Obviously, part of a you know, much bigger uh, political question or questions, um, you know, how do we speak truth to power in the words of Edward Said? Um, protest, protest, resist, as it were, make political art between quotations, without that being in turn sort of ingested, co opted, um, mollified. So, the first note is on love. And I start with a quote by Jean Luc Nancy from uh, the inoperative community, uh, a chapter called Shattered Love. So we know the words of love to be inexhaustible, but as to speaking about love, 
could we perhaps be exhausted? So following research, so I learned that Jew was doing this research on uh, dating websites and the language used by dating websites. Uh, you know, need to love your life between breakfast and lunch, kind of, you know, <laughs> efficiency, uh, speed. Uh, um, so following, following this research, Alain Badiou asked in his book of interviews, uh, In Praise of Love, has love under capital become essentially about guarantees and safety nets, love without suffering, love without chance? Has a capitalist logic even perforated our relationship to love so as to sell it as insured, assured, you know, against risk, against time wasting, controlled, regulated, uh, modified? So he compares this risk-free approach to love to American zero dead wars or smart bombs and argues for a reinvention of the idea of love, not as a contract of gain and loss, you know, what am I gaining, what am I getting, what am I not getting, or even as a strengthening of the social bond through marriage there, what have you, but on a model of life based on risk and, and adventure, and in the case of that, you call it but, so I quote, as an existential project to construct the world from a decentered point of view, other than that of my mere impulse to survive and reaffirm my identity. So, you know, two lovers are leaning against one another, um, in this example, and looking over a beautiful sunset or a landscape. And each knows that the other is seeing that very same landscape. And it is that knowledge of the different views converging, now incorporated into sort of a third subject that isn't there, they're viewing together. This subject that can see the landscape, quote, through the prism of our difference. So that this world can be born, not just to represent what was my own personal gaze, but quote, that love constitutes precisely this paradox of identical difference. So love means the, the model here, identical difference. Um, that's um, excuse me. As we're thinking of love, or of love as a kind of thinking, so how both love and thinking involve for Jean Luc a form of generous reticence. So again, a paradoxical condition. So again, for Nancy, thinking about love is so ancient, so abundant, so diverse. Um, it has not everything already been said, as it were. Similar to, I think, our running theme, which is the you know, relationship between art and politics. You know. we, get to, we get to how this is connected uh, eventually. Are we not exhausted? Have we not exhausted all possibilities? Um, so, you know, if thinking about love, or talking about love, has been exhausted, no one writes poetry about love anymore, Nancy is saying. We find genre novels in you know one dollar shops and Daniel Steele uh, um, kind of bestsellers and so on, and soap operas and new age gurus. Um, this this raises the question of thinking about love precisely through this limit, through its limit. So the the concomitant possibility and impossibility of thinking love also becomes the possibility of thinking the notion or even the life of the community and of being together. Right. So again, but you picks this up in, in relation to communism. Thinking coming to true love as difference, not as sameness, togetherness. Um, so this is a long quote. Um, you know, we don't have to read it all, but um, there's something I think important which I want to get to, which is at the very end. So you know, he's saying how Christian love is fundamentally about loving everyone, and how that fundamentally is impossible. Um, and so, you know, as every construction deconstructs itself in a certain way, so the command of love is impossible is one of those things on which Western thinking as Christian is structured, organized, and derived from. The fact that it is impossible is why it is the answer. Um, he goes on to talk about Lacan and Lac. Um, we, we move on, in a sense, and he says, so to love means to give what is behind or beyond any subject, any self. It is precisely giving of nothing. A giving of the fact that I cannot possess myself. In that case, I would say that to give is the same as to abandon. In other words, to love is to share the impossibility of being a self. And then we go to the body politic or the body political. Towards the end, we think the body of political thought not as an organicity, but of community, as the living to share precisely in the possibility of being in common. So we share what we do not have. Um, I would say the community of love is a community of living to share the absence of common being. There is no common property, and this is what we have to share. That's the first extension of the idea of love, which for me is obviously, for me and others, intimately connected to how we define the political somehow. 
Yeah. So again, you know, we can talk about this maybe in the discussion, but obviously Sean Kanuf talks about this in, in the idea of agonistic politics, uh, agreeing to disagree. Um, Professor Spivak spoke, spoke about this in not wanting to define activism or not wanting to say whether she's with or against a state. Um, so what are the grounds on which we can be together um, when that being together it can be so deadly? So essentially, you know, we're asking, are we just going to talk about the same thing, you know, real politique, oppression, violence, catastrophe, over and over again in the same way until we are exhausted, until we've exhausted all meaning, um, you know, and if politics is about positions or justice or redistributions, how does turning one's back to power uh, enter here? Fiction, double negations, um, you know, at, at the limit of, of representability, of truth, turning on back, um, opacity, a term by art historian T.J. Demos as well, the notion of versus transparency, opacity as a, as a form of making political art as a work. So you see the little detour to, um, not a detour, it's on the way actually, but um, uh, the Deleuze on Beckett, again, another long, we're not going to go through all of that, but, but the Deleuze talks about uh, exhaustion as being far more than tired as having exhausted all possibilities within, and thus all possibilities of realizing anything outside. So I quote, the tired person can no longer realize. The exhausted person can no longer possibilize. When, wants to, when one wants to realize the possible, so I want to come here, I get dressed, it all happens in a specific order, I have plans, goals, preferences. In exhaustion, the set of variables are combined and recombined endlessly and arbitrarily. It doesn't matter if I'm wearing you know, my slippers to come to the talk, or if I don't even go out at all. Um, there is no order of preference or goal to education. This chapter on exhaustion is on Beckett, so we're sort of hijacking that a bit to talk about what we want to talk about here. Um, so as I quote, one was tired by something, but is exhausted by nothing. The exhausted might accomplish something, but realizes nothing. So permutations and combinations have sort of become endless, and this is, uh, you know, for those who know Beckett, but mm -hmm. because she has renounced all need for goal or signification, the exhausted renounces the possible. And therein lies the pursuit of the formulas of the unformulated, but also the seed of, of something possible somehow, uh, which is the paradox for the loop. So if language only names the possible things, and the exhausted has exhausted the possible, how can one combine what has no name? It must then perhaps invent a meta-language. Words no longer realize the possible, but quote, must give possibility a reality that is proper to it. So cut up language, broken up language, dried up language, interrupted flows and voices. This could even mean silence. But even in silence, following Beckett, one must ask what kind of silence one keeps. So what could be, you know, a question that we get to again, it's interesting now because we're going to show the Azam Khalili's work, what could be the posture or the image or the language of living inside exhaustion? So I think I'll probably show you the work first, because you might be tired of me talking at you, uh, and then I'll go back to my reading of it. So this is on a lot of other landscapes uh, by Yazan Khalili. So uh, since I've run out of time, I'm going to sort of zoom through this and maybe just uh, end on, on Yezen, I guess, and then uh, leave the rest of what I want to say for the discussion. So, so we see this kind of photo album, silent you know, photo album, montage of still images, um, uh, as it were, a silent film. 
uh, Khalil essentially deals with the problem of representation, community, and love in and on a landscape that is marked by obviously a violent occupation, a wall no less, where love is not a feeling, but, but a terrain, a landscape from which to think and produce thought on the landscape of, of, of occupation, of blocks to movement. Um, and so I think the idea of, you know, again here, suffice it to say, I think for Khalili, and this is my word, I'm speaking for him, it is kind of counterproductive or counterpolitical to continuously or continually circulate images of the wall to point to that which it is. Um, not only is there violence in that, in that it's reinstating and recreating the reality of the wall, without ever actually capturing the horror of what it is. But, um, so kind of showing without showing what you know without knowing, which is a nice lyric from uh, the attack song. Um, you know, producing a kind of photomontage of this, of this image is paradoxically, it, it wants to be a moving image, but paradoxically isn't being as it is about standing still, about remaining with what is left, um, a fictional testimony of sorts. It points to movement, but it is blocked. It is blocked both formally and internally by the so-called stillness of both the photograph itself and the landscape, clearly without the wall in it. So, I mean, I, I don't really have time to, to rush through, but I mean, what I would have... I, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Judith Butler talked about the, the poetry that, come, that came out of Guantanamo Bay. Um, again, you know, the stubborn traces of life, she calls them, this, this uh, saying that I cannot say. Um, so in a sense, these have become, the, this impossibility has become the driving force um, of, of a lot of work to do with um, suffering, areas of suffering. I think we're, so I'm just going to skip the part on, on the Muslim man. Again, obviously a lot of trauma studies, this, this aporia, this, this idea that we're always too late. We're always already too late for the events after this happens. Um, that this gap is, is paradoxically what constitutes the event. Um, and I, I wanted, if we have time, I don't think we do, to, um, to show something by, by uh, Wadi Dra, the Lebanese artist, uh, and the atmosphere. There was a recent, uh, there was a recent explosion in, in Lebanon in October, a car bomb. And um, you know, having seen this site endlessly, right, these images circulate endlessly, that they, that, that they are exhausting and they have exhausted themselves, as it were, and um, you know, no longer have, have meaning, right? I mean, this kind of common, constant media images. And um, you, you just watch them in the sense there is a kind of sense of a, you know, being a bottomized spectator, as it were, which I'm you know, sure a lot of us feel when we're, we're engaging in the real interpretation, whatever that might mean. Um, so going back to um, to to and this idea of, of the relationship between just being the witness, right? This impossibility to narrate, um, or rather saying that I cannot say, uh, is where testimony and, and witnessing is connected to fiction. And I think the other Canadian that we showed does it in an interesting way. Are we just going to talk about the wall? We're just going to represent the wall. Or you know, colonialism endlessly. Are we going to, you know, um, trick the format, which is the sense of the lot of yesterday from Ahmed Are we going to, are we going to, uh, you know, find another way? Uh, and, and this is where the connection between testimony and fiction that is interesting. A lot of, uh, kind of post-catastrophic uh, spaces, uh, post-catastrophic artworks, I think. And I think the Atlas Group is exemplary of that in the case of Lebanon. Um, I don't know if any of you know the Atlas Group. Um, yeah, and we're done anyway. But if you don't know the Atlas Group, <laughs> you do now. And uh, we have taken you to the website. But um, to see, uh, we can make rain if no one came to ask, which is uh, a sort of, well, docu essay, which is fictional testimony of, of, um, of car bombs in Lebanon, which I think is far more interesting than watching the news of the car bomb. But this is something that we can. We can leave for there. Sorry for taking a little time.